Well, hi there. My name's John Dancy. I'm the CIO at CSRA. Oh, you guys are scaring me with the uh, <laughs> iPads. Um, so I, I'm here to tell you a story about a cloud migration. It's really a story about a burning platform, about corporate leadership, about technical leadership and know-how, about creativity, taking smart risks, and really, not to sound too melodramatic, but really about kind of the, the human spirit of uh, what it takes to actually get through, through what we did as a, as a company. So what I'm gonna do is take you through our cloud migration story, talk about uh, how we enabled ourselves, how we moved things to the cloud, uh, give you some advice, some of the findings, hopefully some of those will come out as I'm telling the story, and then talk about where we're going with the cloud because we are definitely all in. So our spin merge challenge. CSC was a sorry, $12.3 billion company with two divisions. We were a commercial IT services provider and a public sector IT services provider. Public sector was about a $4.1 billion corporation. Now when you look at it from, a, from an IT perspective, as a public sector IT services provider, we had to run our own financial systems. Just about everything else that we had didn't have to be DCAA certified, so we used corporate systems. So everything enterprise, everything data center, everything network, software, was a corporate provided function. On the same, in the same regard, from the business standpoint, our public sector business could essentially run itself. We had administrative folks, we had uh, uh, finance folks, contracts folks, legal, and so on. But we didn't have a lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, corporate functions. So tax, treasury, uh, some of the, the higher order contracts and legal functions were all corporate level um, capabilities. They weren't capabilities inherent to the public sector business. And so when they decided to divest the public sector business, not only did we have to address the fact that there was no inherent IT staff or capability short of our financial systems, the, we also had kind of a skills gap and a leadership gap on all of those corporate functions. So as we're trying to figure out what the heck do we do with an IT system, we also had to go find the system owner or the would-be system owner as we were splitting. Now all of this is still relatively doable. Companies do this every day. Uh, but about two months into the process, uh, I, I remember the meeting well, we were meeting with the CSC CFO and we were talking about a transition service agreement. And if, for those of you who haven't been through any sort of merger or acquisition, typically the, the, the owning company and the spin out company, the spin out company can reach back into the other company for access to services. So you can say, well, you know what, I don't have time to stand up an HR system. Let me continue to run on your HR system until we're ready to stand our own up. Well, in this meeting with the CFO, he said, transition service agreement, TSA, what are you talking about? He said, when we split, we're splitting with no transition service agreements. You have to be completely self-sufficient by the time we split. At that time, it was uh, October 1st. So all of a sudden, I had this burning platform of not only do I have to build an IT department, build an IT capability, stand up all these corporate systems, I have to do it with absolutely no reach back into the other corporation. And the whole idea was, by the time we did that, we're gonna stand up a standalone $4.1 billion corporation and not miss a beat when it comes to how we run the business. And we actually uh, came up with some pretty cool stuff that we'll talk about. But then they said, you know what, your job, it seems like you're coasting a little bit. So we're gonna buy SRA, another $1.4 billion IT services company. And we want you, on the day that we spin, we're also gonna merge SRA into this company and we're gonna stand up a $5.5 .5 billion company. And um, so John, I know you're, 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 you and your team are dedicated to separation, but here's a whole new group of consultants and here's a whole new corporation and a whole new culture. And we want you to start planning for the integration aspects of that as well. So um, this entire process, by the way, from uh, when we started assessing what the IT systems were until we actually rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange was about five months. The actual cloud migration piece was about a three month effort, just to give you an idea. So the way we got through this is we actually, being an IT 
firm, we have a methodology for everything, and we actually have a methodology for how we would go through, assess the applications, and decide where we were going to move. So I'm going to walk you through some of these and uh, talk about how we did it internally for ourselves. So the first thing is just assessing what the heck you have. Um, so app discovery. CSC was a 50-plus-year-old company, and for any of you who have walked into an iced tea shop that's been around for 50 years, things are not necessarily as neat, tidy, and orderly as you would think. So we actually spent a lot of time on app discovery. We talked with system owners. We actually had to go to the business owners to find out about the systems that we were actually going to move because the people who kept those systems up were retired. We had to go through documentation. We had to do interviews. Um, it, was, it was something else. We actually, coming out of that, we ended up with uh, the, the spreadsheet to end all spreadsheets that had every application all the way down to the, the size of the VM, the amount of storage, all those kinds of things. And we created a DFD, a, a data flow diagram, so we could actually understand all the interfaces between all of the systems. Then we walked through a cloud adoption assessment and said, which out of all of these things can we move to the cloud? And there's actually a pretty, pretty structured process we went through. And the whole idea was where in the world are all these workloads going to go because we're receiving all these systems we weren't expecting. And it was pretty simple. Is it going to go on-prem? Am I going to stand it up in my own data center? Is it going to go in AWS or to the cloud? Or are we going to try and uh, retire systems and push as much as we can to a software-as-a-service platform? And then an awful lot of planning. Uh, program management discipline is everything in these kinds of programs. So a lot of disciplined programming went into all of this. So ultimately, we ended up choosing AWS to, to do this project with us. And the reason we did is, first and foremost, they could match our pace. I, I think we actually, Rodney Grilly um, helped us a lot with this. We actually, within a couple of weeks, had pretty well architected what things were going to look like in the cloud, all the way down to our network architecture, security architecture, and so on. And we pretty much said, okay, this is good enough. We're going to go with it. And um, so we got it engineered, and then the tools and the software and the professional services that we got could actually keep up with us uh, as one of the, the few companies that could. Uh, obviously, we wanted FedRAMP compliance. As a federal systems integrator, we, uh, we house PII data, and that PII data, when it gets aggregated, is considered controlled unclassified information. So we need to be able to control that, make sure that we're, we meet every federal regulation around uh, CUI. Um, if any of you haven't seen the latest FARS and DFARS clauses, uh, everyone has to be, if you're a company like ours, you have to be NIST 800-171 compliant by December of 2017. Well, moving to FedRAMP, a FedRAMP cloud is the first step in getting there. And then finally, just the, the overall customer service and partnership. How we work together, um, we, we actually stood up a war room. It was, it was actually a conference center room, and we just took it over and turned it into a war room. And we had all of our service partners in there with us, as well as our own team, um, copious amounts of Red Bull and horrific snacks. I still go in that room today, and I think I can smell Red Bull. Um, but, but without a doubt, AWS was able to, to saddle up with, side, get alongside with us in that war room, worked day in and day out. Uh, many of us ate three meals a day in there for about uh, three or four months. It was, uh, it was something else. So what did we do? How did we actually make the move? We did three things, well, two things, and then I want to talk about app migration. So first and foremost, we had to stand up our own data centers. All of our workload was in our commercial, the commercial part of our company's data center. They weren't FedRAM compliant. They, didn't, they couldn't meet FISMA moderate the way we wanted to and so on. So we actually um, we have a center down in uh, Shreveport, Bossier, Louisiana, that has capabilities. And then we went and led a contract with a uh, colo provider in Durham, North Carolina and uh, built out a 5,000 square foot suite where we were gonna put our kit. And then literally on uh, Labor Day weekend, actually the Thursday before, we shut down all of our systems. We, we pushed as much as we could onto a V-block. I think there are about 400 servers on that V-block alone. So we pushed all of our uh, workload, all of our servers onto that V-block and onto its associated storage and then shut it down Thursday night 
uh, disconnected it, powered it down, put it on three semis with armed guards, and uh, just to make life difficult, went from Delaware down I-95 on Labor Day weekend to Durham, North Carolina, installed it, tested it, and had it up and running Monday night. So, um, and I think the number of cable connects that we did, disconnects and connects, was about 8,000, and only two of those cable connections were missed. So uh, it's quite a story. On top of that, we defined an entirely new network. Remember, this, this is like an opportunity to rebuild everything and not have to put up with a lot of the, the mess that you got. So we went, we went all brocade, all software-defined network. We defined an entirely new architecture. Uh, we defined a new WAN architecture and actually performed the WAN cutover on the day we, uh, the weekend before we switched or the transaction went through. Um, and again, had to build an IT staff. I think I got 60 people to start with. Uh, ultimately, we were going to about 300. Uh, thankfully, SRA had a standing IT staff, so we were able to actually move pretty quickly and pull some of those people in. And um, we also deployed an entirely new soft, uh, secure, cybersecurity architecture. So our host-based protection, our endpoint protection, uh, mobile device protection, all of those we ended up saying, you know what, if we're gonna buy all this stuff, let's buy the best, let's buy next gen, let's buy something that represents our company and deploy it all. So um, it wasn't as though we just copied everything and moved it over. Now in the cloud is a, is a slightly different story. We actually took every bit of x86 workload that we had and we moved it to AWS. We also extended the CSC network to AWS and we can talk about that a little bit. And uh, we used Racini to actually do all of the migrations. So it's a little different story if you were in the previous session. Racimi actually works with you to uh, identify servers, identify interconnections between servers, and prepare move groups. And then basically they take a copy of the server image, they take a copy of your data, they push it over the pipe, and uh, re-provision uh, the server in AWS. And as long as the bandwidth and the connection stays true, by the, once it's done, an exact copy of that server sits in AWS. And uh, we did that, we're sitting with about, keep me honest, 400 servers and about 750 terabytes worth of data in AWS right now. And we did it partly through that process. I wanna take credit for Snowball as well because in some cases we had, uh, you're smiling, uh, we, we, uh, we just had some bandwidth issues and we finally said, you know what, we can place a, we can use our, P, our Amex, we can buy some drives from, AW, or from Staples, plug them in, fill them up, ship them down to the other data center, and uh, move the data that way. So where there were real bandwidth issues, we did the, uh, I'll, I'll call it sleet instead of snowball. <laughs> um, we also, we had Lotus Notes, which thankfully we're off of now, uh, but I had to, to rehost Lotus Notes. And then we found 38 different subscription services that we didn't even know about. Uh, it, our legal department, for instance, had six subscription services that um, you know, they just went and procured on their own. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, well gosh, I guess I have to stand up six of those, those ex six services again for you. So there's a major procurement exercise just to go through, uh, once we identified it, to contact the vendor to see if they could put, stand up an exact copy of that, then integrate it into this entire architecture and perform tests on it to make sure it's up and running. So we did that 38 times. Now the way we got through all of this is that that huge app inventory that we had, we went and met with the business users and said, you know what, I could probably copy everything over, but I can't guarantee you I'm gonna stand everything up and have it running on day one. So tell me the bare minimum that you need to run the company. And so they might you know, say they've got 50 different applications, they'll say, okay, well I need these 10 to run the company. So what we did is we focused our efforts and our testing on those 10 systems, figuring that we would come back and get those systems another day. Now the, the dirty secret is, since they told me they didn't need to run the business on it, they're trying to get me to stand them up now and I'm telling them, no, you already told me you don't need it, so why would I do it? <laughs> uh, let's see, am I missing anything? Lots of shadow IT. Um, yeah, we had to renegotiate about 500 different vendor license agreements. In that time, there were three that uh, were really problematic. I am happy to tell you the names of those vendors if you want to talk about it afterwards. Uh, almost everybody uh, worked well with us. A couple put us over the barrel. If you've ever been through this and you, you've got a burning platform, 
There are some you're going to see it as an opportunity for partnership, some for profit. And uh, I'm happy to tell you who those companies were. And then lastly, we did a release strategy. So we did these server copies and we moved everything over, but you can imagine there's a huge amount of testing to do. We had to re-IP everything, uh, get it up in the cloud, then do integration testing. It was a slightly different focus because we knew the image worked and so kind of the unit testing piece wasn't nearly as important as the integration testing. Um, but what we did to uh, lighten the workload on the people who were working around the clock on the organization was we actually grouped things together in releases and we had spreadsheets miles and miles long of checklists around cybersecurity, around networking, around applications, around user tests and so on. And we would go through uh, just about every Friday afternoon, we would kick it off and we would run the, run the release. Uh, the biggest one was release five that actually had all of our uh, HR systems. So we actually moved HR, payroll, uh, stood up a new Workday instance and ran payroll all on that same weekend. And uh, thankfully everyone got paid, you never missed a beat. So how, do you, how did we go about transforming these things? So, there's a lot of work goes into actually, you know, if, if you spend time up front, the technical piece is going to follow, and it's going to follow pretty well. So we did, we did a lot of affinity grouping where we actually analyzed these apps, lots of interviews with the system owners, with the business owners, looking at readiness, dependence, dependencies, and so on. Then we started to group those things together. And then we decided on an app application treatment for them. So we looked at our app inventory, we looked at the DFD to see what the interfaces were, what the dependencies were, and um, decided how we were gonna move some of these. Some of these workloads, we actually had to just do straight rebuilds. They didn't lend themselves well to the Racini tool. Uh, so we'd have to go, especially Windows, if you have any old Windows 2003, uh, you should plan on rebuilding those. Um, but what we're here to talk about is rehosting. So rehosting, looking at uh, area seven up there, migration execution, the Racimi tool is what saved us. And just to give an idea of the timeline of this, uh, it was at this event last year is when we met the Racimi team and said, you know, maybe there's something there. Let's give this a shot. And so from that conversation is where we, what got us to where we are today. So um, we, lent, we leaned on their automated tools. We um, also leaned on them. You know, we, we feel like we're pretty smart technical folks, but we know we're not the smartest. And the people that know how to run those tools and who've been there before, whether it's from Racimi or from AWS are the ones that we relied on. And uh, I think we were smart enough and hopefully not too proud to actually listen to them. So um, that's a key piece. Uh, the Racimi Dyna Center tool is, is really something to behold. Uh, basically, there's a discovery, a capture, then it actually clones, and then, um, helps configure and stand up the new instance in AWS. Uh, the, the thing that it did for us, our, our timeline, especially the, so SAP, our human capital management and, and payroll, runs in AWS. That's 55 servers we had to move with about 50 years worth of history in there. So uh, those were pretty time consuming. Um, so, it, and it was complicated in terms of understanding how everything worked together. So the other thing that Racimi does is they use a product from a company called Risk Networks called Cloudscape. You actually install those on your servers. After about a week, you get a pretty good picture. After about 30 days, you get a pretty excellent picture as long as you understand your subnets. And um, it'll show you what servers have to move with what servers. So um, we were able to actually put together move groups. SAP was probably our most complicated. Um, then we also used the AWS import export and again, we had to do some straight rebuilds uh, where especially Windows 2003 just doesn't like to use the Racini tool. As far as creativity goes, the other thing I'll bring up is, um, you know, you're pushing so much data over a pipe. You know, 750 terabytes is a lot to transfer, even in three months. And, um, you know, especially with SAP, I seem to remember, we'd get about 30 hours into the data transfer and it would drop. There was no recovery point and we'd have to start all back over. And you can imagine when you're in three months, 30 days is a heck of a lot of time to lose. Um, so w we got really creative. What we figured out is Windows 2003 didn't like to transfer to Windows 2003. So we stood up a Linux box in our data center. We transferred to a Linux box. And then in AWS, we stood up a Linux box. 
we transferred Linux to Linux, and then we went from Linux to Windows once we were in AWS. So talk about getting creative. I mean, whatever it took to get through is what we did. And then finally, the validation, right? So we had lots of regression testing. Uh, we did performance baselines to make sure we hadn't lost anything along the way. Uh, we ran about 10,000 test cases uh, as we did these releases. So leading up to the releases and then actually on the release weekends, um, the entire business was in the office running tests. The release strategy, I think, is probably what saved the day for us. If we had tried to do any sort of a big bang cutover, we never would have made it. So we started out small. Our release strategy over the 10 releases was let's take some low risk systems that aren't criti as critical to the business. Let's release and move those first, see if we can't run the company on those, see what's up with the network, see what's up with all these kinds of things get a little better, do the next round, the next round. And again, by the fifth round is when we did our mission critical HR and payroll systems. And then we had a, a huge push on go live support and hyper care. Remember I said we had, we had no IT function. So one of the SaaS applications we had to stand up was our own instance of ServiceNow. And then we actually had to hire and stand up an entire service desk function. So all these people that were fielding the calls from the users that just got migrated were brand new. So. Um, we, had, we, uh, we leaned on CSC at this point because we hadn't separated, but then uh, we had a whole hyper care uh, capability running every weekend and for weeks that followed to make sure that our users um, were well supported. And then here's our cloud architecture. I don't even, you know, I won't even pretend to brief this to you. Um, again, we went into to, to FedRAMP, GovCloud. Um, the key for us was Direct Connect. So we use AWS Direct Connect, which is FIPS 142. Is there a dash two in there somewhere? 140-2, um, which is a tunnel into AWS. All the traffic routes through our gateways. And um, then what, you know, the work up front that AWS did for us is they helped us with the VPC strategy. So we have a management VPC, we have a production VPC, uh, test VPC, and so on. So um, I wanted you to see this because I'm going to put up another slide after we went through AWS's well-architected program. We'll show you how we started there. This was really good, but how we've gotten better since then. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, just like everybody, we spread our workload across two um, availability zones. So the result was success. On November 30th, we actually... Uh, that's me, a couple from the left with big bags under my eyes, um, up there ringing the bell, um, this first day of our new company. Um, a little story, uh, if you ever go ring the bell, you have to ring it for 10 seconds. And I believe you start a few before and you run after. And if you screw it up, the entire floor of the New York Stock Exchange harasses you unmercifully. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, gosh, who was the star, Jennifer, anyway. Jessica Simpson did it the week before, and she took her finger off the bu button after like five seconds. And anyway, Larry did better than Jessica Simpson, <laughs> ringing the bell. So what did that do? That, that led us up to separation, right? And that, that really set us up for a stronger move to the cloud. It, remember, we have another $1.4 billion company that we've got to integrate now. So we're shifting from how in the heck did we separate to, to what in the world are we going to do next? So what I'm going to talk about now is number nine down there, continuous improvement. When we, when we found out that we were going to have to merge another company, we actually started about a month before the split looking at all the systems and actually planning the integration. It took us two months to go through the integration planning. In short, I had two HR systems, two travel management systems, two AP systems, two finance systems, two of everything. And we had to figure out how in the world do we, do we take these two companies, not miss a beat, and continue to operate. So what we did is we, we focused on several areas. One is unified communication. So how do, we, how do we have a consistent CSRA email address so we could say to the world, hey, we're one company, we're operating that way. Um, HR, what do we do with our HR systems? And you can work your way all the way around um, and if you, if you go all the way up to the top, you see IT foundation and operating model, network security and IDAM. There, there's really two elements of what we, we tried to do with integration. One is build a solid foundation that the company can grow on. Because again, we move fast, we shove stuff in the cloud, 
Uh, when we put stuff in that data center, the paint literally was not dry on the walls. Um, so, so how do we build a solid foundation at the, at the same time, how do we keep the company moving ahead? So how do we actually um, help the company define its new operating model? And what happened is we started out saying, you know what, business, you come to us, you bring us your requirements, and we'll figure out uh, what we're going to do with the IT systems. And it was an entirely new company, so people weren't quite sure what the requirements were. So what, what I said is, you know what, IT gets to lead the integration of the entire company. So we started just calling meetings and bringing the HR people into the room and saying, you know what, we got SAP HR, SAP Payroll, Workday, and then SRA, you run on Workday. Uh, we use Legacy CSC uses Taleo for recruiting. Uh, Legacy SRA uses iSense for recruiting. And we started forcing this, the discussion. So we actually took a leadership role in, in the integration of the two companies. Again, the early em emphasis was on app integration because we figured if we could force the discussion and integrate apps, we could start to bring the company together into a consistent operating model. And then we looked at all the foundational architectural elements. And really, what we did, the key to success, again, talk about taking risks, is we said we're not going with a single best of breed solution out there. We're gonna figure out who has the best of the two, so two solutions, and we're just gonna adopt that one, and we're gonna keep moving. And uh, for instance, in HR, uh, the, the, if you can imagine on CSC, the interface between SAP payroll and Workday, it, it's a little finicky. And SAP already had a fully configured, or SRA already had a fully configured uh, HR and payroll system. So we said, you know what, yours is good enough, we're gonna scale it up to 19,000 employees, and that's what we're going with. So not, we, we're not spending a lot of time. I think separation taught us how to quickly assess a situation, make a decision, and keep moving and manage our risk smartly as we go. So where are we today? Well, as you can imagine, we took two legacy IT architectures. Uh, the emphasis was on building a consistent operating model for the company. So we're in this interim state right now where we still have those two legacy architectures. We've built um, a trust between the two. We're actively running integration projects. Uh, we've got 57 projects, 13, actually 14, one finished today. So we've got 14 projects that are complete. Um, and we've got another, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna do math in public. Um, <laughs> another lot of projects going. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then on top of that, uh, you know, this is just on the application side. Then we have all the architecture stuff. Uh, if you can imagine, SRA, not only do we have applications that were disparate that fulfilled the same functions, we also, cybersecurity, uh, their SIM tool and our SIM tool were two different ones. How we looked at logs and how they looked at logs were different, how they aggregated those things. So we have to re-architect and figure out how do we bring all those things together. And so we're in this interim state today right now. Um, oh gosh, and then we actually, if you can think about it, we actually had to rewrite every policy as well. So we had to, at the time we split, I remember sitting there at about 11 o'clock at night reading through a stack of paper about this thick on policy saying, okay, yeah, this is, this is the new company's policy. Well, then you take SRAs and we actually took the opportunity to take the stack of paper from this thick down to about this thick and rewrote all of our policies and procedures. Asset discovery is the other piece I wanna hit. If any of you are considering any kind of migration, the one thing I would tell you is spend time on your CMDB, spend time on understanding your assets, your network configuration, where your subnets are. But you know we're, we're building our end state architecture. The key to building it and then actually moving into that end state architecture is understanding where you're coming from. So if you don't have a good CMDB in your ServiceNow or Remedy instance, you don't understand where your assets are, you, you run a risk of not ha covering all your bases as you're doing a migration to the cloud, as you're doing a migration anywhere. So spend time on asset discovery if you haven't. So again, that, that big block uh, looks deceptively simple. It's incredibly complex. It's our new CSRA corporate domain. Uh, and the final step will be actually moving all of our servers into that new domain. Um, so again, right now, the interim state allows us to have our applications integrated and work seamlessly but we want them all in our new architecture. 
So the end state architecture, I know you can't read it, but you'll see on there, uh, you know, we, we went to the well-architected program, we worked with AWS and they, they took a look, they said, okay, here's what you guys have been doing for months. Now we understand your, your enclaving strategy and where you wanna go. So here's, here's what you need to do. Uh, and they've actually helped us with our HA posture and our security posture. They've simplified the architecture. Uh, and some of those, some of those uh, VPCs you see up there, there's one called Leverage, there's one called Corp, uh, there's one called Test, and a tenant. And so I'll talk about what those are, but, but basically those are setting us up for that move into our final architecture. And this is a very simplified version of a, a highly well thought out, well engineered uh, architecture. But basically what we've done is we've established enclaves. So we have a corporate enclaves where all of our typical business systems run, everything from HR and finance to uh, our collaboration suites, you know, intranet, all those kinds of things, our sales and contract systems. Um, but then we also have something called a leveraged enclave. So we have systems that we use for ourselves and that we also um, host for our clients. A good example would be ServiceNow. Um, my service desk team uses the same instance of ServiceNow as 20 of our other government clients. So we have to have a leveraged enclave where those, those things can live but they never touch our systems. Um, part of that is for security reasons, we don't, and also for compliance reasons. We don't want to have to adopt uh, the security compliance say of a uh, NIST 800-53 when we only have to be at, um, across all enclaves when we only have to be at 171 in our corporate enclave. So this strategy helps uh, buffer and separate out different systems based on security classification and so on. And then finally, customer enclaves are um, anything that we host for our clients. And underpinning all of that, we have an on-prem virtual capability for a, a PaaS cloud-like uh, platform as well. But then we just as equally have workload running in the Amazon GovCloud. Did I miss anything? Nope. So where are we? So the advantages are uh, cost, flexibility. That's a safety net for us, AWS is. So anytime we run into a pinch, we, we don't have workload, we can't move fast enough. AWS is what actually allows us to move quickly. And the application architecture, that, that entire en enclaving strategy and where we're gonna put things uh, is, is helps us, we're helped out with the uh, AWS GovCloud. Some lessons learned, again, you've heard me talk about, um, oh, wait, I'm skipping ahead. So the first is, um, there's no magic bullet. This stuff is hard. Um, you know, it, it's hard the first time, I guess I would say. You know, <laughs> where, you know, especially the pace that we, we uh, went through. So, you know, things like leadership, solid program management, uh, good planning, good technical know-how, a little bit of creativity. Uh, I always talk about taking smart risks. We took a ton of risks, but I like to think that they were smart risks that seemed to have paid off for us. Um, you know, those things are what's gonna get you there. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's so funny to hear people talk about cloud and it's almost like it's been mystified. And I, I guess at this point to me, it doesn't seem very mystical. It's, uh, it's a place where we do our work. Um, it's about as exciting to me Moving workload to the cloud is about as exciting to me as seeing the light come on when I open the refrigerator door. It's just what we do. Uh, so plan for bandwidth, again, it's awfully hard to move 750 terabytes over uh, certain connections over, you know, under very tight timelines. Uh, automation cannot migrate everything. We, again, sometimes we put stuff on hard drives and FedEx them across the country. Um, sometimes we just had to do straight rebuilds. So. Um, plan for that. Uh, Re-IPing may be required. Well, in our case, it was required. And again, listen to your partners. They're, they're absolute experts. So today, we've got about 40% of our workload sitting in either AWS or in SaaS. Um, it's not a dev test environment for us. This is where we run the company. So again, HR is there, payroll's there, SharePoint's there, uh, identity management's there, that management VPC has our AD in there has certain other servers. Um, it's just where we run the company. It's, it's seamless to us in terms of uh, what we do with the cloud and what we decide to put there. 
So it's an integral part of our overall architecture. I'm keeping an eye on Matt, who's my enterprise architect, to see if he winces at all. So far, he hasn't winced, so I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> so the, the last thing, the last slide, and then I'll take as many questions as you like, is um, where are we? So when we made this move and where we sit today is we got about 20% of our, our systems, our SaaS applications. So you heard me mention ServiceNow, Salesforce. We do a lot with Salesforce, uh, Workday, and so on. And then we've pushed about 20% of our workload to AWS. We plan to continue that. You know, it, it used to be that CIOs got together and they talked about how big their data centers were and uh, how many megawatts you had. Well, you know what? I've got a two tiny data centers, and I'm really proud of those two tiny data centers. And my hope is I never move out of those. You know, between being able to push things to the cloud to the amount of efficiencies that we're getting in a data center, how much you can put in a square foot these days, my hope is that 5,000 square foot data center I've got in Durham is all I need. So I'm gonna continue to push to the cloud uh, more aggressively as we move towards 2021. So with that, I'm gonna stop there, see what sort of questions you guys might have. And uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll pull Matt up or I'll make something up. Yes, sir. So I had an, so the question was in the last presentation they talked about the importance of training to do this kind of uh, a move. I'm very fortunate in that our company was already working hard on AWS and AWS certification, so I was able to get uh, a lot of certified engineers to come in and help. But then again, I relied very heavily on AWS professional services to actually come in and do some of the heavy lifting because my guys had just gotten their certifications, so you need that balance. You always want the pros to come in and, and show you where the bodies are buried. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How would I estimate the move? Gosh, you know, Matt, do you have any thoughts there on, on estimation? You know, we, we, we continue to push things to the cloud. And for instance, we're, um, we're bringing two SharePoint instances together. We figured out it wasn't smart to try and stand those up on-prem, so our staging environment's in AWS while we're, while we're doing that work. So I don't know if that... Yeah, I mean, th that's a really tough one yeah, because there are so many of those factors that go in, right? How, how thorough is your app discovery? Uh, how ready are those apps to move? Uh, what's your throughput and bandwidth? What's your strategy for actually making the move? I'm uh, it, that's yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, I, I hate sounding like a, a carnival barker up here, but come by the CSRA booth. Uh, you know, <laughs> anybody will... Uh, be happy to talk with you about that. But th yeah, I mean, there are so many factors that go into that. It's, it's almost impossible to tell. We, we never stopped to think about it. We just, we were moving. So we just, we just kept plowing ahead. Or, or Sam. The so actually, th so the question was, did we look at cost optimization as we were doing this? The answer is no. We said, you know what, we're gonna make some really dumb decisions as we go, and uh, we're just gonna have to clean the mess up later because I have to meet that date. Um, the reality is we didn't make many bad decisions. I've had a couple of pieces of software I bought that I'm actually retiring because I thought I needed them that I don't. Um, and with the well-architected program, that actually helped us move around workload and, and balance it. And it, you know, it's just gonna be I wasn't a CIO before this project ended. I am now. Um, so if, if you never want to be a CIO, don't do well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, but, but you know, now that I am, I'm, I'm finding there's all sorts of cost optimization activities that we need to do. We bought Cloud Checker, as Matt just mentioned. 
to help us manage our cloud workload and make sure that we're, we're running it well. Uh, I'm also in the middle of implementing something called Aptio, which is a, um, it's also a SaaS service, but it, it helps you understand the elements of cost and build it up all the way to an application. You know, my goal is to get to understand exactly what my cost per VM is in my data center versus AWS, and then through CloudCheck or another, other cloud management platforms to be able to move workload where it belongs based on its intended use. I'm sorry, you were gonna ask a question? Yeah, I'm trying to think in terms of the AWS move. So, so probably the, the thing that surprised me the most is the bandwidth and the throughput and trying to actually push all that data down the pipe. Um, but we were up and running and identified, I think we had our first move group identified about a week and a half after we installed the Cloudscape tool and got to work with Racini and we were starting to move workload. So it, it did not take long, but then so SAP, again, was our, our most difficult move just because of the sheer volume of data, and that actually took through the three months. I mean, towards the end, it was, it was like catch up, you know, old dev test stuff and old dev test environments and so on. But uh, it was pretty, that, that's probably the most surprising piece. Uh, let me catch back here. So the question is, what, what sort of factors are, are keeping us from going 100% cloud and SaaS? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, part of it is the investments that we have, we wanna make good use of. So, um, you know, it, what's funny is when we got into this, we actually cut a huge number of POs to populate that data center. And part of the, part of the move to the cloud was actually I think Teresa actually mentioned it in her keynote about waiting months for servers to show up and those kinds of things. I'm like, holy cow, I can't wait that long. So we started pushing stuff to the cloud. Well, now I've got this actually underutilized capacity in my data center that I'm paying for. So I wanna use that well and use it over the life of the depreciated life of that. Um, at, at the right point when the economics work out, I don't, I don't have any prejudice or bias. Um, as long as I can secure it and, and validate to the, to the SEC, to the shareholders, to the government, that my data is secure. I don't care where it sits. I really don't. Uh, this gentleman had a question, then I'll pop over there. Uh, very few code modifications. We actually had to modern. So now the smart guy is going to talk. See, just like I said. So the answer was uh, we had to re-IP so many things and it was in a new namespace, so we actually had to recode many of the applications to accommodate that. <laughs> just like I said. Um, let me see, I think there was a question back here. Again, with the Racimi tool where you're just doing a server image copy, it, it didn't matter to us. It had more to do with the data and being, having the right target environment stood up. Now I'm looking at Matt just to make sure I didn't say anything horrifically wrong. Yeah, the data transfer issue is without a doubt the, the most tricky. But an application running on a server when you're, I mean, think of it as taking an image of your laptop and running, you know, sticking the image on another laptop. That's essentially what we were doing. So we didn't care that much. Again, we, and also we're moving all x86 workloads, so they were ready to go. Yes, sir. I don't know. 
We did, and we got rid of them. <laughs> That's why I don't remember. They were just, Matt just made them go away. It was magic. <laughs> Ah, sorry. So the question is, how has our move to the cloud impacted our customers? Um, well, I think in, in one regard, as an IT services provider, we've got the scars on our back. The ex scars, I'm sure the AWS people are. <laughs> but, you know, w we understand some of the tricks, the tools of the trade. We're actually, that, that program that uh, Teresa announced today, we're actually part of that. Um, we've, so I think we're in a better position to do that uh, from a, you know, and, and as we're moving towards that final architecture, uh, the whole reason we're doing that is for flexibility and speed um, and to try and make those, those migrations more simple. And so um, I think it set us up very well to do that for our clients. Yes, sir. Do I have? Do we have? There's only one region in GovCloud. Multiple AZs, yes. So across the AZs, yes. I'd take five and a half months to do this, I guess. Um, <laughs> would I do anything different? You know, I don't, you know, because the other thing, I think kind of getting to your question as well, is our entire company has a completely different mindset than it did before. And I think that burning platform, the speed with which we had to move, I, I think, again, I, I think so many people are treating the move to the cloud as something really hard. Again, I, I use the word mystical. And none of that scares us or gives us any pause now. And I think it, it deepened our sense of appreciation for solid engineering for really good project management, but it also changed our attitude in terms of how quickly we're willing to move, how we assess and manage risks. Um, I, I think we are so much better having been through that crucible of, of the five month move. I, honestly, I wouldn't change it. Yes. Do we have any database workload in the cloud? So we have SQL Server, we have Oracle workload, uh, Matt, am I missing anything? SQL yeah, SQL databases are up there. So we've got some Oracle databases. Um, so we moved all of those as, as we did the move. So again, if, if you want to get into lots of details, the smart people are um, down at our booth and um, we're happy to talk. And you know, I'll be down there. I'll make up some answers if, uh, <laughs> if you like. Yes. I, I'm sorry? How much are we saving per year? Well, it, it's hard to, to define a savings because of where we started. So we really don't have a good baseline because we were run, only running our own uh, IT system, our financial systems. So we didn't have the entire corporate set. And I never slowed down to go back to see what CSC's costs were. So I apologize. I can't give you an exact savings. I can tell you I'm happy with where I am from a cost perspective with what's in, what's in the AWS. Would it require you to make regular moves across the region to get into the big things? Yes. So the question was, we did a, a physical move of our servers down to our other data center. We did the AWS move. Um, yeah, so, so I would say the move we did do onto our V-Block and then down the road, um, it was a little less stressful just because we controlled everything in the environment. We understood what it was. And some of the AWS stuff was new to us. Um, so I guess I would leave it at that. It was, it was a little more comfortable doing the physical move. But uh, nowadays, if you ask me which one I would do, I probably doesn't matter. I think I saw a hand over this way, or we? Okay. 
I think we're good. I think I'm what's standing between you and some adult beverages. So uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you.